Well, good morning. Hi, friends. Didn't expect to be doing this again. Thought we'd left all of this uh, behind. Uh, but as you've probably heard by now, Sarah and the kids uh, all tested positive for COVID this week. Uh, I didn't inexplicably. Uh, but uh, out of an abundance of caution, uh, we've uh, I've decided to avoid non-essential contact and uh, the team decided it would be best if I recorded my talk for this morning. Um, huge thanks to everyone who's been in touch with messages and offers of help. So appreciated. Thank you. Uh, we're all doing fine. Uh, the, uh, the Sarah and the kids um, sort of got uh, sort of cold kind of symptoms, but generally on the whole, we're all fine and just looking forward to being back together. Last week, uh, I started our new series on the heart with a prayer that God would give us eyes to see the heart the way he does. I said that we instinctively see the heart as at the centre of ourselves. We often talk about listening to our heart uh, or following our heart. Um, if a friend uh, has a, a big decision in front of them, we might say, what is your heart telling you to do? We seem to know instinctively that our hearts hold sway uh, over us. They tell us what to do. They're kind of like the control room, the flight deck of our lives. And that idea, that's not a fanciful idea. That is a very biblical idea. Uh, last week, I introduced our anchor verse for this series, the verse that we're going to keep coming back to over and over again. And it's Proverbs 4, verse 23. Proverbs 4, verse 23. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Above all else, guard your heart. Everything you do flows from it. And if you remember, we, we looked at the Gospels to see that Jesus himself teaches this way of looking at the heart. In Mark 7, uh, for example, Jesus says, it is from within, out of a person's heart, that our thoughts come. And the Bible teaches consistently that everything we do, whether conscious or unconscious, whether we are uh, conscious of it, we realise it or not, all of it, Everything we say, do, think, feel, every gut reaction, every decision, every choice that we make, all of it comes from somewhere. And that place, the Bible teaches, is our heart. And you know those times you find yourself uh, saying something or thinking something or hearing someone else say something and you stop and you say, where did that come from? Well, the Bible teaches us it comes from our hearts. It's from within, from out of a person's heart that it comes. Our lives are lived inside out. As one very wise person said, whatever happens to us on the outside will depend entirely on what we've become on the inside. It affects everything, how we deal with life. So if we're going to live well, uh, we need to pay close attention to our hearts. We have to practice cardiology. I'm quite serious about that. We need to pay close attention to our hearts in the same way as a doctor, as a cardiologist would pay attention to a person's medical heart. I think it's as true in the spiritual realm as it is in the material or medical realm. We need to understand how our hearts work. And just as importantly, we need to understand how God works on our hearts to form them, to, to change our thoughts and desires, to change the things that we love so that we can cooperate in becoming the people that he longs for us to become. Those people he longs more even than we long to become. Those people he longs for us to become those people. Real followers of Jesus, real image bearers of Jesus, apprentices uh, in the way of Jesus, learning to live the way he did uh, as freely and as abundantly and as joyfully, as contentedly as and as fruitfully, of course, um, as he did. Uh, we need to know that that is possible for us, that we can change, that we will be changed as our hearts are formed and renewed in the likeness of Christ. I wonder, do you want that? I do. I want it for me. I want to live my life that way. I want to have the life that 
I was made to have. Uh, and I'm learning that that starts with my heart. That's the reason for this special series. And uh, I'm so excited about what I have been learning. And I ended last week at the place we're going to begin this week. Uh, and that is with St. Augustine. Uh, here's a picture of him. St. Augustine, of course, is our patron saint. Uh, our church is named after him. But I, I wonder if you've ever wondered who he was. You won't have come across his name in the Bible. Uh, he lived uh, sometime after Bible times. He lived in the fourth and the fifth century in modern day Algeria in Africa. He's called St. Augustine of Hippo uh, because he came from a place called Hippo. It's no longer on the map, but at the time it was a, a thriving port. Now, Augustine made one of the most famous statements about the heart outside of the Bible. He said this. You have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Read it again. You have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. And the reason this statement is so famous is not just because it's true, but that's because it was his testimony. Augustine was a man of uh, incredible talent uh, and charisma and potential. Uh, he was phenomenally gifted in the art of public speaking, in the art of rhetoric, as it was called. And there was no skill more highly valued in Greek and Roman society than that, than the art of oratory, of speaking publicly, uh, being able to persuade someone of your point of view, to be able to debate and to tell stories, to move people's hearts. Augustine was incredibly good at that. Whenever he spoke, his words had weight. And the closest thing we'd perhaps have to it is a top top, top communicator um, in, in the fields of maybe politics or the arts, drama or music. Someone with the measure of skill that they operate on a world class level. I, I was thinking maybe someone like Barack Obama, when he speaks, the world listens. Augustine was one of those people. The world was at his feet. Uh, he had everything he wanted. Uh, gold, glamour, girls. He had the lot. And yet he found as famous people uh, so often do, that none of this was really enough for him. He found himself always uh, wanting more and more and more. And although he lived a life of extremes, extreme indulgence, um, extreme sensuality, he found it was never enough. And he kept coming uh, over and over again, face to face with his emptiness. Uh, the reason for that, I'm sure, was that he had a Christian mum. She was called Monica. We uh, know her as Saint Monica, actually. Uh, and she prayed for Augustine all of his life. She prayed that her son would find God. She probably prayed that he would never be satisfied with all of that worldly stuff. And guess what? God answered her prayers. At the age of 33, St. Augustine had a dramatic conversion moment, which he narrates in probably his most famous book called The Confessions. And that's where we find this phrase uh, that is so famous. You have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. And I want to call my talk this morning The Restless Heart, because like St. Augustine, you, me, we all are owners of restless hearts. We don't always realise this. Uh, you might not be especially aware sitting in church this morning uh, of it. I find church has an amazing way of inoculating us against the reality of how we feel the rest of our weeks. Uh, for one thing, it's a day off. Uh, for most of us. And we don't come to church often with the restlessness and anxiety of an ordinary day. But the fact is, we are all owners of restless hearts. If you have a heart, it is a restless heart. That is the nature of the heart. Scripture teaches us this, especially the Psalms. The language of the Psalms is the language of the heart. And they speak constantly, you'll know this if you're a student of the Psalms, of longing. Just a few 
uh, examples. Psalm 38 verse 9. O Lord, all my longing is before you. My sighing is not hidden from you. Psalm 73, 25. Who am I, have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth I desire besides you. Psalm 84, verse 2. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. Uh, Psalm 119, verse 20. My soul is consumed with longing. Psalms, I think, diagnose us so well. They tell us that we are owners of hearts that are longing, that are restless. And what's the meaning of this longing? Where does this restlessness come from and where does it take us to? The answer in both cases is God. He gives us this restlessness. He gives us this longing in order that he can satisfy it. Here's Psalm 107 verse 9, for he satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul he fills with good things. The quest for rest, the longing we have inside each of us for completeness, for that thing which fulfills us and satisfies us is, Augustine discovered, only satisfied by God himself. You have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. And Augustine found God. He fell in love with Jesus and found it to be true that rest is found in him alone. And many of us here this morning have found that to be true. Some of us are discovering it to be true for the first time in this season. Most of us need to be reminded that this is true, that there is a restlessness inside our hearts, which manifests itself in innumerable ways. Uh, unless your soul is really rested in God this morning, and I, I you know, I, God bless you if it is, I pray that it is. Unless your heart is really rested in God this morning, you will already, even this morning, I guarantee it, have been carried along on the flow of your heart's restlessness. Maybe not in uh, terribly obvious ways, but certainly in significant ones. You will have been busy trying to establish your worth, your value uh, to God, to yourself, to others. You will have been busy trying to shore up your lovableness, your significance, your sense of power uh, and agency, your competence and your ability. You will have been busy already even today getting other people to see and to recognise your accomplishments, uh, proving that you've been right about something. Uh, you've been doing the right thing. Truth is, we've been doing it all week. You and me, we all do it all of the time. By way of just one example, this week, have you found yourself saying something like this? Well, I did say this at the start, or... It would have been nice if they consulted me on that. Unless your heart is really rested in God this morning, you will have been busy, I promise, trying to prove yourself, to establish your worth, and often comparing yourself to other people uh, in order to shore up your own identity, your own sense of worth and well-being. When the truth of the matter is, all of those things have already been established for us in Jesus. If you are in Jesus Christ, those things have already been given you and you have no need trying to establish them yourself. Perhaps the best illustration of this is in Jesus's teaching. In possibly the most famous of all of the parables, the parable of the lost son, uh, I know we'll, most of us know this parable so well, but let's read it again and hear the restlessness that it captures. Jesus continued, reading from Luke chapter 15. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. 
So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to the father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. This story never fails to move me. Uh, someone asked Charles Dickens, once the great novelist, in all of literature, which is the story that moves him most? Which is the one that has the most pathos? Which one uh, captures the, the human condition best? And he replied, oh, there's no question. Uh, the parable of the prodigal son. There's nothing like it in all literature. Uh, A.W. Tozer, who I love, said this about it. When I'm reading through scripture and I come to this passage, instinctively I bow my head. Something in me wants to go down in adoration before the heart that could think of that story. Yes. Amen. Here is the human heart on display in all its restlessness. It was restlessness that caused the son to leave his home and his father to go searching for his own meaning and significance and, and worth and value. And it was restlessness that brought him to his senses and caused him to turn around and return home and return to his father. And what we're meant to see, I believe, if we've got eyes to see it, is that what the son wanted, what he was most restless for, he had all along. And that so perfectly, I think, captures the, the condition of our hearts, that longing that we have for meaning, uh, for uh, significance, for belonging. Uh, and for security, uh, also for joy and for happiness, is ours already. We already have it if only we would rest our hearts in God. And one other thing I notice about this story, people have studied this little story for thousands of years, and some people have asked, quite rightly, I think, why do we not see the father going out looking for his son. Why does he not send the older brother out to, to find him and bring him home? Why doesn't he send one of his servants out to bring him home? And I wonder if maybe it's our restlessness. It's the, it, this restlessness we have is given to us as a kind of homing device. Is maybe our restless hearts are given to us so that we never stop searching until we find ourselves home. Your heart and my heart are restless. They want to go looking. They want to go looking for their own fulfilment, their own completion, their own satisfaction. But what your heart needs is a home. And I'm sure you remember seeing those um, 
heartbreaking scenes on TV or maybe in a TV drama where you've got parents uh, in a press conference, a police news conference, and they're in despair, uh, making an appeal for their lost children, um, perhaps uh, an appeal to kidnappers to let them go or uh, terrorists. And often they say, we just want them home. Well, God's heart is the same as that. He just wants us home because when we're home, then we're safe. And until we're home, we're not safe. Coming face to face with uh, COVID this week, uh, again, in my own home and, and much more weightily, talking this week with a dear member of our church family whose beloved wife was uh, taken into end of life care this last week. I can't help but remember how fragile life is. Our time here is limited. It's short. And one day, sooner than we realise, it will be over. Do we know where we're going next? God puts this restlessness in our hearts, I believe, so that we, we put our rest, we find our rest, both for this life and for the next life in him. This life is wonderful in many, many ways, but it's not a shadow of what's to come. The Bible says no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart could conceive the things that God has prepared for those who love him. If life as we know it is this good, and we know there's so many wonderful things about life, how much better will things be in eternity? How much better will heaven be than the life we're experiencing now? But the Bible is equally clear that those things only await those who love him. Salvation and the promise of heaven and all those good things are a free gift, but only for those who receive it. And we have to receive it. And that restlessness in our hearts is there, I believe, so that we will receive it and we will have no peace until we do. So two prayers as we close this morning. One is for those of you watching who right now feeling that God is calling them to come home. Uh, God is calling you to finally find your rest in him, to rest your heart in him. Uh, you know the gospel, you've heard the gospel, you've heard that God sent Jesus to save us from our sins, that he died for you and that he rose again so that you could have new life. But you've never actually accepted that gift for yourself. You have never rested your heart in him. But this morning, like the prodigal, something in you has just opened your eyes and brought you to your senses and you know it's time to come home. You know in your heart that God is finally uh, the one in whom your heart needs to rest and you want to trust Jesus Christ as your saviour and receive the rest that he longs to give you. If that's you this morning, I'd love you to uh, bow your head and your heart and pray with me. And just pray these words in your heart. Father, I know it's time that I stopped running. I know it's time that I stopped chasing down my own identity, trying to establish my own worth uh, in my achievements and my accomplishments and comparison with others. I know it's time that I accepted uh, who I am, that I am your child. And so I do. I turn to Jesus and I trust him for my rest in this life and the next. Make me a Christian. Start a work in me to make me like Jesus and draw me increasingly into your heart and your love today. Amen. And another prayer this morning for those of us who have husbands or wives or children or parents, uh, or siblings, or friends who don't know the Lord, who haven't rested their heart in him. Or maybe they did once, uh, but they've uh, 
run away from him. They're playing the part of the prodigal this morning. Um, I wonder if God is calling us this morning to pray afresh for them, to pray like Monica prayed for her son, Augustine, that the restlessness in his heart wouldn't go away until it finds its rest in God, that nothing would satisfy his restless heart until he came home to God. And perhaps we should pray for them now. And perhaps as we launch Alpha this week uh, here at St Augustine's, uh, there's time for us to turn a prayer into an action and invite that person who's on your heart to come and experience Alpha for themselves this Wednesday. So let's pray for them too. Lord God, would you please, as you did with St Augustine, stir up a restlessness in those we love who don't yet know you, to turn to you, to give their lives to you and to rest their hearts in you. Lord, we pray, would you speak to them? Come, Holy Spirit, move upon them and draw them into your love. In Jesus' name, amen. If, um, if that's you for the first time, you've found your rest in the Lord for the first time this morning, um, use this time of worship to just mark that moment to have have this truth written on your heart that you are a child of God. You unravel me with a melody You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone cause I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God yes I'm no longer
Cause I am a child of God Cause I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God Yes, I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God Cause I'm no longer a slave to fear So may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and his Son, Jesus Christ, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us all, all those we love and care for, now and forever. Amen. identity is in you. Thank you that you run after us, that you chase us down, that you give us that longing for you. Help us to find our rest in you this morning, Lord. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. My song, let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song. Let the king, let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide the ransom for my life oh he is my song you are good good oh cause you are good good oh you are good
the king of my heart be the mountain where i run the fountain i drink from oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the shadow where i hide the ransom for my life oh he is my song yes father god you are good you are good